Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians. We're going to start a new series in 2 Corinthians today. Excited about this series. I don't know if I've ever really studied through the book of 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and so we're going to do that. Um, this was uh, one of the things about this. Does anybody have a Sunday school sheet? Does anybody need one? Brother Daryl can get you one if you need one. Anybody need one? Go ahead and get those out. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll, we're going to um, be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 today. Uh, but this is a series that was the last series that the author that we use um, wrote. I was just going to give you this real quick. And it, it, it was, um, I don't know, many of you know, we, uh, especially you teachers, y'all, y'all appreciate this more probably than the others. But we use this Journey series. Tommy Higgle is the author. We've been using these for a lot of our books and really enjoy them. Uh, but this was the last one he wrote. It said, uh, this was in the, the preface of this, it said, Tommy began writing this journey series uh, in 2017 on this book and continued writing through his pancreatic cancer in 2018. He was determined to get it finished, and he wrote until two days before he entered his heavenly home. And he was writing this, this series. And so it, they said as you're studying this, uh, some of the lessons might take on some new meaning uh, for you, knowing uh, that he was writing this right as he was, Right as he was passing away, uh, and then the uh, the cover on it, it's got uh, about being in uh, earthen vessels, and uh, that's one of the um, the the the, the uh, verses there in this is uh, ver- uh, chapter four, verse seven, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And uh, so he wrote this as he was dying of pancreatic cancer. And so um, uh, I just wanted to share that with y'all. Uh, let's look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, this is really one of uh, a great epistle, great book. It's got a lot of famous verses and passages in it. Um, let's just look at an overview real quick of some of these. Look at, uh, we'll just flip through, all right? Look at uh, chapter 4. Some of my favorite verses in chapter 4, you find, in verse 3, look at verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Um, look at verse number 16, it says that, that you're, though the outward man perish, uh, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We look not at temporal things. Verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18, we look not at temporal things, are things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, look at chapter 5, verse 7. It says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body as be present with the Lord. How many of you have known that verse? You've heard that verse all your life, and you, didn't know, you probably didn't know where it was, right? It's right there in 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Isn't that a wonderful verse, a wonderful thought? That Why, why do we do what we do? Because... We love God and God loves us. Look at 5.17. This is one that we all know, right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at this is, to me is the, I don't know if I'd say the most important, but greatest, whatever, doctrinal verse in the New Testament. Chapter 5, verse 21. Look at this verse. There's no verse that explains justification uh, better, I think, than this verse in the Bible. For he hath made him to be sin, speaking of Jesus, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Does that not explain the vicarious suffering of Jesus better than anything? Does that not explain the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ better than any verse, I think, in the Bible? Uh, So that's an important, very, very important verse. Uh, Look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 1. This is probably the greatest section or greatest passage on separation. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And it goes on down through there and talks about that, right? Uh, look at verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. So it's one of the greatest passages on separation. Uh, chapter 8 and 9. Uh, I'm sure that Brother Stephen Underwood hears a lot out of chapter 8 and 9. This is the greatest chapters on giving uh, in the Bible. He goes to all those those missions revivals, and I'm sure that he has heard a a message or two out of that that passage there, right? 
So uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, those are the greatest passages on giving that you'll find. Uh, look at chapter 12, and we'll just do this one and we'll move on. Chapter 11 does talk about how that Satan is transformed into an angel of light. You know, we, we, you talk about that, and that's, that's where it's found in chapter 11, verse 14. Chapter 12, though, is where Paul's talking about having that thorn in the flesh, right? And what does he say in verse number 9? This is a, a wonderful promise in the Bible, right? A wonderful promise. Look at chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that a wonderful verse? And uh, so uh, this is a great passage, I'm, a great book, great epistle, and I'm looking forward uh, to reading, uh, to, to studying through this book. So let me give you an overview real quick of Corinth. Corinth uh, it was a church that Paul founded uh, about A.D. 50. Uh, do we have our map? I love maps. All right, so here's our map. And so uh, this was, this was uh, Corinth is found. Uh, here, this is Greece, where Greece is. You can see it there. Corinth is found in the bottom part there of Greece, uh, in Achaia. Macedonia, this, Macedonia is actually where he was writing the epistle to them from, is the northern part of Greece up there. That's where Thessalonica is found and Philippi. Uh, they're found on that northern part of Greece. Um, Achaia and then Corinth is found on the, the southern uh, part there. Of Greece, and he founded this on his second missionary journey in AD 50. He's probably writing this about AD 56. Uh, so he founded it there in, in Corinth. Corinth, if you can see, there's a, there's, a, there's a strip of land that's called an isthmus. I don't, I don't know if y'all know what that is. I don't either, but it's just a strip of land that goes down through there. And, and there's a port, a major port on both sides of that isthmus. And so Corinth was a very important city. It was a very prosperous city because of this. So there was a lot of, of wealth because of, of the, the ports there and that they would transport through there and bring things through. And so it was a very prosperous city. But along with that, it was a very ungodly city. They say that they had an amphitheater there that would seat 20,000 people. Uh, they were really big on sports, all right? They say that it was second only to the Olympics. The actual Olympics was the, the athletic competitions and stuff they would have there at that amphitheater. Can you imagine that? A 20,000-seat amphitheater. They didn't have the, uh, the, 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 the mics and the lighting and the, and the big screens the way that we do, you know. But 20,000 people would come to watch athletics back then in that day. Uh, I find that kind of crazy. Uh, but one of the more... Wicked things they had there. They had the, the temple, to, what they called the temple to Aphrodite. The goddess of love was there. And they would have, at that temple, they would have a thousand prostitutes uh, at the temple of Aphrodite. They actually did that. You know, we, I'm, I'm going to try to not digress here too much, but we talk about how horrible our society is and all this kind of thing. And don't get me wrong. It, it, we, are, we are going more and more wicked and getting more and more immoral. But let's don't, let's don't act like, you know, we, we live in this world that, that nobody's ever lived in before. I mean, they lived in a wicked, wicked place then, and they lived for God then, all right? So don't, don't say, oh, you know, and get so scared. And I've heard this a lot, and I'm, I'm not belittling it, but, you know, oh, what about our children? They're never going to be grow, raised up in this horrible, well, listen, it is bad. And we got it, but, but we, we, we need to realize that, that they lived in some horrible situation there, and they lived for God, all right? So uh, it was a bad city. Uh, there was actually a term that went around, a uh, Greek phrase, I guess you could say, that was a, a, a known saying, was to act like the Corinthian, to act like the Corinthian, to live the, like the Corinthian, or to act the Corinthian is what it was, it was. And it literally meant to be immoral, to, make, to commit fornication. So that's the kind of place that Paul is writing to here. He's writing to this wicked city. Um, and, and so he's writing this letter to them. You see that in verse number 1. It, it talks about this, writing this letter to them. Uh, and, and this is actually, we have two letters here. We have 1 Corinthians, we have 2 Corinthians. This is probably the fourth letter that he wrote to them. In 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's chapter 5, verse 9, he talks about this letter that he had previously written to them. Uh, he, he's trying to teach this church how to live in an immoral society that they're living in. So that's, re that's the main reason he wrote 1 Corinthians, was to teach them how to live in this immoral society that they're living in. 
And, and so he wrote this letter to them, and then he write, follows it up with 1 Corinthians. And then you'll see in chapter 2, verse number 4 there of, of, of 2 Corinthians, he wrote another letter in between the uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He wrote this letter, it's a severe letter, a sorrowful letter. He's sort of, he's sort of getting on to them about some things. Uh, and then he writes this fourth letter uh, to them, uh, which we have as 2 Corinthians right here. Now this 2 Corinthians, it's more more personal letter. What had happened is he had wrote 1 Corinthians to them and covered a lot of doctrinal issues. They were having some issues with, with fornication. He wrote about that uh, in marriage. And he, he wrote about the misuse of, of spiritual gifts. And, and he, he basically, he, just, he, get, he gave them doctrinally what they needed to do in the teaching of it. And they couldn't refute that. They couldn't refute the scripture. They couldn't refute his, you know, the, the, the writings of it. And they couldn't refute it. So you know what some of these false teachers and these people that wanted to practice bad things, you know what they wanted to, they started doing? If you can't attack the teaching and the doctrine, what do you do? You're going to start attacking the person, don't you? That's what people do. They're going to try and find fault. So that's what they had done with Paul. And so they started trying to attack him personally and attack his apostleship. And so in this letter, it's very personal. A lot of it is, is describing his ministry, and a lot of it is describing his apostleship. And so he is, it's a very personal kind of letter. So let's read a little bit of this. Uh, let's read these first um, seven verses here. Look on, on there with me. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in, Acha in all Achaia. So we see it's written by Paul. He says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. That word apostle, it means a sent one or a messenger. And he is, he is sent out with the, the great commission, right? That's what he's doing. That's where he goes. Everywhere he goes, that's what he does. Starts churches, plant, uh, you know, disciples people, uh, plants these churches and, and preaches the gospel. And so that's what he's doing. He's the apostle of Jesus Christ. Now we do understand that there, that there's a different we are all called to be apostles. We are not called to be apostles in the sense of a, of a, 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 a Paul was, but we're all called to be apostles. Then he goes on to say uh, in the second part of that with Timothy, our brother. Um, so who was Timothy? We've studied Timothy the last three weeks, right? So we should know who Timothy was. He was, he was uh, his companion. He was his, his traveling assistant that was sent with him uh, to many places. Philippians 2.22, it uh, talks about Timothy. Who can... Read Philippians 2.22. All right, thank you, Andrew. All right, so Timothy has proven his worth and has served Paul like a son in the gospel. I think that's our, your first blank there. Uh, so uh, Timothy was with him there. And it's sent to the all the saints which are in all Achaia. So that's that, that southern part of Greece there he's sending this to. Now notice what he says in verse number 2. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the way that you really see all of Paul's epistles starting out. He, he sends this greeting all the time. It's grace and then it's peace, right? Grace, what is grace? Grace is that undeserved love, that undeserved acceptance, uh, that, that merit, that favor that God gives to us that we do not deserve. And what comes along with that? Peace comes along with that. So grace uh, the result of grace is peace. Let me just, there, there can be no true peace without the grace of God. There just isn't. There's, there's no true peace without the grace of God. Uh, you, you'll never have, people will never have that peace that they're searching for without the grace of God. And that's the reason Paul always puts it that way, grace and then peace. He puts grace uh, be to you and then peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this peace, it is talking about this inner tranquility, I guess you could say. That's what we're looking for, whatever. Uh, but this inner peace that, that is talking about that. But peace also uh, is talking about with, with our other people, the, the conflict, uh, the absence of conflict among people. Um, and wow, have we not seen conflict among people lately? I mean, it seems like for months, for, well, for the year anyways, this political season that we've been in. Um, this COVID season that we've been in, it just seems like there's conflict with people. And what does he say? He says, grace be to you and peace and peace and peace from God our Father. Don't we pray for that? Don't we long for that um, in our country, uh, in, our, in, our, in our 
society that we live in, in, in our church, you know, I think God has blessed us, but, you know, there's, there's conflict in our families, don't we? We want that, right? So it talks about this grace and peace. Um, Romans 12, 18 talks about this, this idea of having peace with men. Who can read Romans 12, 18? If y'all will help me with this, it'll help us get through it all. Brother Blaine. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. All right, so that's your next blank. If possible, much depends on me, I must live peaceably with everyone. So we need to live um, peaceably with everyone as much as we can. And may that be our response to all these things that are going on now as Christians to live peaceably as much as possible uh, with all men. Um, let me explain something real quickly. Uh, I think I have a moment. Well, the way that, that we do these verses, the way that they're sent to us, is if it is not in quotes, that is not, that is not a quote from the verse, all right? Because uh, some people have asked about that. They're like, is that a different version? No, that's a, that's a paraphrase, an explanation of the verse. All right, so it's taking the verse and giving it to us, um, explaining it. That's, that's, that's really expounding the scriptures. That's what a preacher or pastor or, or teacher does, right? So don't take this as that, that's the wrong verse. That, that is not. Uh, anytime, to, whenever we put quotes on it, that's when we are using a quote from the Bible, all right? Uh, Brother Jack, when he does it, he always puts the quote from the verse, the, the actual verse. He'll write it out down there too, and that, that's great because uh, he doesn't want anybody to be confused on that. So we are not using another version. That's not what that is. That's just a an explanation of the verse and w- sharing what they want you to get from the verse, all right? Uh, so we are to live peaceably with all men. Now let's go into verse 3, all right? And here's going to be the the... the text of what we're going to use. So verses 3 through 7. Let's read these 3 through 7. Uh, and I want you to notice some, some words that we're going to see. We're going to see trouble, uh, affliction. We're going to see uh, suffering. We're going to see those kinds of things. And then we're going to see comfort. All right. So we're going to see these things in here. It's blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Who comfort the, now I want you to notice how many times you see trouble, tribulation, those affliction down through here, all right? Who comfort us in all our, what does it say there, tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those which are in what? Trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comfort of God. For as um, the sufferings of Christ abound, so we talk about sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be, notice what it says, afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the during of the same sufferings uh, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, there you see it again, so shall you also be of the consolation. So he's talking about how to deal with trouble. We all have problems, some serious problems. And in this passage, he's going to teach us how to deal with serious problems. So why God allows problems to come into our life. And he gives us several reasons, all right? So one reason here he gives us is so we can listen to others more compassionately. So number one, so we can listen to others more compassionately. Look at the first part of chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Now, I want you to notice something. Uh, notice this phrase, blessed be God. What is it that he starts off by doing? He's going through affliction. He's going through suffering. He is having a rough time. Uh, look at verse, look at, look at, let's see, what verse is that? And think in verse chapter 8, we'll talk about this again later, but he says that they are pressed out of measure, even despaired of life. That's the kind of trouble the apostle Paul is facing. And what is the first thing he does? He praises God. <laughs> Notice it says, blessed be God, blessed be God. He, he is praising God. You find that phrase three times in the Bible. You find it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You find it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And then you find it here in, um, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it's talking about blessed be God because of what he's done in the past. Isn't that wonderful? Can you do that right now? Can you think of something God has done for you in the past? And you can say, blessed be God for what he's done for me in the past. Amen? Uh, I'm sure we could all just take testimony time and think of something God has done for us and say, blessed be God, right? All right? We could do that. 
Well, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it's, it's, it's talking about blessed be God because of what He's going to do in the future. Can't we all just take a moment and think of what the future is going to be like and say, blessed be God, amen, amen, right? Isn't that wonderful? Blessed be God. But in this one, in Ephesians, or in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, what is he saying blessed be God for? What's going on right now? That's a little tougher. Sometimes we look around and life ain't going the way we want it to be going right now, and we're suffering, we're afflicted, and things are a little crazy all around us. But what does the Apostle Paul start all off by saying? Blessed be God. Hey, he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. Blessed be God. So it says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what it says here. We're talking about how we should listen uh, to others more compassionately. The Father of mercies. The Father of mercies. This mercies, it refers to compassion or pity for the problems of others. Um, and, and in this verse, it says the Father of mercies. That means He's the originator of it. He's the, the, the beginner of it. Uh, with Him is where all uh, pity or compassion uh, stems from. It comes from. And this starts with a willingness to listen to the hurt of others. That's what God does for us. Uh, time and time again, you find it in the Psalms where He talks about how God was merciful and how He listened to his prayers. Uh, who can look at Psalm 145, verse 18? Brother Pete, please read that for us. The Lord is nigh to all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Isn't that wonderful to know? When you call on God, he is listening to you. He is merciful. Um, let's look at this passage. I want you to take your Bible, we'll turn over to Lamentation with me. I think this is my favorite passage on this idea of compassion and mercy. Look at Lamentation chapter 3. Now, what, when was the prophet Jeremiah writing Lamentations? Anybody know when he wrote Lamentation? When was he writing it? Uh, right, well, it was right after the fall, actually. He's writing it from Jerusalem, when the, looking over the city that is burnt down. All right? So that's when he's writing it. Look at Lamentation 3, verse 22. He says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Isn't it wonderful that we, we serve an eternally uh, merciful God? He is always willing to listen to our prayers. He wants us to share our hurts. He wants us to share our frustration. He wants us to share our fears with Him. Isn't that wonderful to know that's the kind of God that we have? We have a God that is the Father of mercies. We have a God that will listen to us. You know, we're going through some rough times, and I've heard some people that are in despair. I mean, just in despair. You know, they think that the world is ended, and, and they are in despair. But you know what? We have a Father of mercies in heaven that cares about you. We have a Father of mercies in heaven that has compassion on you. We have a Father of mercies in heaven that will listen to you. Isn't that good to know? Um, you know, I don't know if God's done with our nation. I don't know. But I, I believe that God is a God of mercy and that we as His people can come to Him and beg for mercy, beg for forgiveness and repentance, and He'll hear us. He'll listen to us. I know that. Now, I want you to take this and, and let's, 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 let's take it and apply it to us. So what does this mean for me, that he's the father of mercies? Uh, let's look at um, Luke 6.36. This is an important verse. Luke 6.36. Who's got that? Luke 6.36. Somebody read that for us. Miss Joanne. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. So what does it say? Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. So, God is merciful. God listens to us. God has compassion and cares for us. And therefore, we should be merciful to others. So when we're going through this, this suffering and this hard time, and God listens to us, we need to remember there are other people out there that are going through hard times that we need to listen to. Uh, we, need to we need to care about the cares, the hurts, the fears. Uh, have compassion uh, on others. Now, we're not referring to your chronic crybabies, right? Those people that are always having whining every day. We're not, we're not necessarily referring to that. We should try to have compassion. Um, sometimes it's tough. Uh, and those that are always causing the drama, yes, we understand. Uh, but we should, be, we should show mercy. Uh, we should have compassion. We should care about those that are going through rough times. 
Uh, it, it seems like we have lost this. I don't know if it's social media just makes people this way or not. I don't know what it is. But it seems like people have lost it. I mean, they don't want, they don't, they, you know, if somebody starts saying, they don't want to hear anything about it. They just want to, you know, as long as it's not affecting them, they're very selfish in that way, self-centered, right? Uh, but we should have compassion for others. You know, a lot of times, I don't want to get into this too much, but a lot of the thing going on with the COVID thing, there's some people that, that just, they have zero compassion for other people when it comes to this thing. You, you know, they, they, ought to, they ought to understand, you know, don't they know what the numbers say? You know, they ought to act like this and that, and you know. Well, some people are scared. They're scared. Maybe, they're, maybe, they're, maybe it's unmerited that they're scared, but they're scared. And we should learn to have compassion. Now, that doesn't mean we, we forsake truth. We have truth and we want to explain truth, but it's the manner in which we do it. We ought to do it with compassion. We ought to care about others. Uh, a pastor said this one time, uh, this, and you have to deal with this a lot in ministry and, 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 and deal with it a lot. Like if you're a teacher and these kinds of things, you have to deal with it a lot. He said, um, I used to get upset at the interruptions to my work until I realized the interruptions are my work. Isn't that a good, isn't that a good thought? Isn't that true? Isn't that very true? Here's a question, I want, and I want, I want you to write this down. All right? I want you to write this down. Write this question down on the back. What if God listened to you the way that you listen to others? What you think about that? What if God showed mercy to you the way that you showed mercy to others? How do you listen to others? What about your coworkers? Do you listen to them? Do you listen to their concerns, their cares, their, their, their hurts? Uh, what about your church family? Do you listen to them? Let's get a little bit closer to home. What about your husband or your wife? Do you listen to them with compassion? Or do you just... You know, tune it out. What about your children? Do you listen to them? Uh, so this idea of listening with compassion, listening with compassion. All right, second thing here. So we can comfort others more effectively. So we can comfort others more effectively. And I think this is the gist, the main point that we're going to look at here is this idea of comfort. So look at the second part of this verse here. Um, Verse 3, it said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. And what does it say? It says, the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. That word comfort there, we find it a lot in this passage. Uh, actually, I think we find it ten times in this passage. No, look at it. In verse 3, you find comfort. Uh, in verse 4, comforteth. Uh, comfort. Comfort. Comforted. Four times in that one verse, right? Look at verse number five. Consolation is the same word. Consolation, you find it there. Look at verse six. Consolation, you see it again. Look at verse six again. Comforted. Look at verse six uh, at the end of it. Consolation. Look at verse seven. It says, knowing that you are partakers of the suffering, so shall you also be of the consolation. So you see ten times. In, in this book, you find 11 times you find the noun for comfort, 18 times you find the verb for comfort. So it's a very important subject that he's talking about here, about this idea of comfort. Now, what does it mean when we talk about comfort? This comfort is, is from a, a, the Greek word paraklesis, which means to come alongside to help, to come alongside to help. Um, this is the same word, the same description that is given of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16. Who's got John 14, 16? Somebody read John 14, 16 for us. Brother Lamar. Pray the Father, and he shall give you another comfort, that, may be, that he may abide with you forever. All right, so the idea here is that God has given us this comfort, this, it's called the paraclete, that comes alongside and he helps us in our trouble. Now, let me explain something to you. Comfort is not the same thing as sympathy. All right, those things are not equal. You, you, you ought to put that comfort does not equal, you put the equal as sympathy. They're different, all right? Sympathy is when you feel sorry for somebody and you come along and you pat them on the head and you, you feel sorry for them and, and you might give them a little toy to pacify them or something like that to make them feel a little better, but that's not what comfort is. You know, you do that with children, right? You know, the kids in the back seat crying and, 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 and you, you feel bad for them. They're, they're screaming their head off. And you give them a little toy so they'll stop. You have no idea why they're crying. You didn't really help them in any way. You just pacified them, right? That's sympathy. But that's not what comfort is. Comfort is not just making us feel better, all right? Comfort 
is coming alongside us and giving us the strength to deal with whatever we're having to deal with. It, it, it's helping us through the process of, of the trouble or the affliction or the suffering or the problems that we have. And so that is what the, the, this idea of comfort is, is when God comes alongside of us and he strengthens us. God comes alongside of us and he lifts us up. God comes alongside of us and he helps us through that trouble and through that problem. How have you ever faced something you didn't think you're going to be able to make it through? What is the only thing that helps you make it through? It's the Lord. That comfort. And that's what this comfort is talking about here. He is the God of all comfort. But God wants us to be good stewards of this comfort. God wants us to be good stewards of this pain and this hurt that we face. Uh, we shouldn't face it for no reason at all. We should, we should have a reason for facing it. Look at verse number uh, 4. It says, Who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation. That word comforteth, it's, it's, it's a present tense. It means that he is constantly, he is unfailingly, he is always comforting us. Isn't it good that, that no matter how many times you face trouble, God is always there. He is never leaving us. He has never forsaken us, right? He is always there. And notice that word tribulation. It says that, that he comforted us in all our tribulation. That literally means to be under pressure, to be distressed. Now, the Apostle Paul knew what he's talking about. Look at verse 8. He says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So he's talking about some serious, big-time trouble, some tribulation that he's facing. Uh, and, and he says that God comfort, He is constantly comforting us in even the worst of our trouble. Now, why does he do this? Look at verse number 4 who comfort us in all of our tribulation, that, all right, so he's giving the reason, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. So what is he, why does he comfort us? So that we are able to comfort others. God doesn't intend for his comfort to end with you. He wants us to be a pipeline, as, as Dad often uses the word, a conduit to bless, to, to comfort um, to comfort others. Notice this, it says that he comforts us in our all of our troubles so that we can comfort them which are in any trouble. So does, do we have to know exactly what you're facing in order to, to help comfort you? Uh, you know, I, I've often, I, we often hear that and I, I've, I've probably been uh, guilty of even saying it myself, well you don't know what I'm what I'm dealing with, you know? And is it true that whenever you've dealt with something, you're better able to deal with, uh, help somebody that's dealing with the same thing? No doubt about it. Now, listen, we, we understand that. You know, uh, I might have a personal thing that, that's happened to me that happened to somebody else, and they can help me better with it, all right? I, you know, maybe you have trouble with a child, and, and this person has the same kind of trouble with a child, and y'all have a bond, and y'all can help each other. Maybe you've lost a loved one, and, and they've lost the same a loved one in the same way, and y'all can help each other. But, does that, but what, is the, what is the true help? Where is the, the root of all of this? It's from God. And we all can understand the comfort of God. Uh, that's the reason I might be able to help you in a situation that, that I've never faced because I realize I faced something and God helped me through that. And so God can help us in, uh, help us in any of our troubles, any of our comfort. But here's the thing. He doesn't, he doesn't want it to stay with you. He wants you to pass it on. Everything we receive from God, we are to pass on to others. That's just a good principle that we find throughout all of the Bible. Uh, Matthew 6.15 shows us uh, one instance of this principle. Matthew 6.15. Who's got Matthew 6.15? Brother Pete? But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we are to forgive because we've been forgiven. We need to pass on uh, that forgiveness. Brother Brother Gabe preached a great message on that the other night about forgiveness and how important that is that we pass it on. But God is consistent. God wants us to, if we're comforted, God wants us to comfort others. We ought to, we ought to pass on that comfort. We'll know better how uh, to comfort others whenever we, um, we're faced with that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of, of several people um, that I always see at funeral homes. Uh, I, I think of one lady in particular. 
um, it seems like every time I go to a funeral home of somebody that you know is in our church or something like that, they're always there. They're always there. You know why? I think I, I know that 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 her father had passed away, and 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 uh, and and so she got people that came and helped her whenever that was happening, and so she always goes to the funeral home. Uh, I think that a lot of people have gotten away from doing that. I don't know if that's just because of you know we that that was a. a Older people do that or whatever, but it seems like a lot of people have gotten away from just going and being there and helping at the funeral home. But that's the way this lady is. She always seems to be at the funeral home. I don't know that she ever really says much to the people. I don't know that she sits down and counsels anybody. I'm sure she doesn't, actually. But she's always there. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's a picture of what we need to be doing, too. We need to be passing on. We need to be comforting others whenever we have a chance uh, to do that. Now, notice verse 6. He says, and whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation. Uh, he's saying that we, we, it took, through much suffering, we brought the gospel to you. Okay, through much suffering, we brought the gospel to you. And this church was probably one of the worst. <laughs> okay, let's just be honest about it. This, this church probably caused him more headache and trouble than a lot of the other ones did. Uh, they, there was all kinds of trouble going on in there, all kinds of things. He, he spent 18 months there. Uh, and he, I imagine that they probably caused him quite a bit of grief. Um, but what does he do anyway? He comforts them. He comforts them. Now, this is not, we don't, we don't comfort others just because they deserve it. Why do we comfort others? We comfort others because God comforted us. That's like forgiveness. We don't forgive others because they deserve it. We forgive others because God forgave us. Well, and so the same should be said about comforting. Um, even to those that, that, that haven't been so nice to us, we should comfort because God has comforted us. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. 1 Thessalonians, blank. So don't render evil to evil. Uh, so we ought to comfort us, even those that haven't been so nice to us. We ought to be willing to comfort them and help them through their troubles. That's tough sometimes, isn't it? So that's tough sometimes. Somebody doesn't help you when you're, you're going through it. You don't want to help them, but that we ought to help others. All right, last one. We'll be done. Number three. So we will cherish God's comfort more dearly. So we will cherish God's comfort more dearly. Look at verse 5. It says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. <clears throat> he uses that phrase there, the sufferings of Christ. So the sufferings of Christ. And that means this, that we are suffering in the will of God. And so we ought to try to help those that are, that are uh, comfort those that are living for Christ in this hostile world that we're living in. Um, I want you to look at this. Look at verse 5. For as the suffering of Christ, it says, abound in us. So our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. That word abound, it has the idea of a river that's overflowing and, and, and going out of the banks. And, and so what, what's, what it's talking about here is as the sufferings abound, what happens with the consolation? It abounds. Hey, as the suffering increases, God's comfort increases. It's not bestowed in advance. It's the bestowed when we need it. Uh, as the, 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 the problems abound, the, the solution abounds from God. As the, 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 the trouble, the tribulation abounds, the comfort abounds. once read the story of a, of a man that was arrested for his faith. And uh, he was... Um, condemned to be burned at the stake. And this uh, soon-to-be martyr, as he was in his jail cell that night, um, was wondering if he was going to be able to be a good testimony, be a martyr the next day. And so he took a candle and he put his hand over it to see if he could take it, to see if he could take the flame. And what did he do, of course? He, he jerked it away and it burned him. And, and, and he and it, almost in despair, he's thinking, I won't be able to do this tomorrow. I won't be able to be that martyr that I need to be. But when the time came, God gave him the grace to be a wonderful testimony, a wonderful martyr uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's the way that God's comfort works. We think, well, I can't deal with this. I can't face it. I can't, I, I'll never make it through this problem that I'm going through. Well, let me tell you something. If you, if you, if you lean on God, you depend upon Him, that, as that suffering abounds, that consolation, that, that comfort much more abounds. So we see that it abounds. So there's three sources of comfort. You might want to write these down. Three sources of comfort that, that we're given here. Uh, one is the promises of the Bible. Two is the presence of other believers. And three is the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So the promises of the Bible, the presence of other believers, and the power of the Spirit. Um, what is your favorite Bible verse? I want you to write it down in that blank there. That, that's, that's the next question, I think. What is your favorite Bible verse? Somebody just, real quickly, somebody tell me your favorite. Mine is Matthew 6.33. Seek you first the kingdom of God. That's my verse, right? Hey, Brother Pete, what's your favorite? What? Philippians 1.6. We're going to look at that one here in just one second, aren't we? We're going to read that one in a minute. Who else has got a favorite Bible verse? Brother, Brother, Brother Lamar? 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10.13. Who else? Got a fa- Brother Daryl? Job 23.10, what does that one say? Hey man, wonderful, I'm glad he knew it. Uh, you hate to put somebody on the spot and they don't know it, right? It's a good job. <laughs> All right. But we have a favorite, why, why are these verses our favorite Bible verses? A lot of times, and most of the time, is that in, in trouble or in times when we needed it, that verse was there for us, right? And so that's the, the great Bible verse. How do you have a, a brother or sister in Christ that you just depend on? Somebody that you, you can go to. Somebody that you, you know uh, has your back, right? Why is it that most of the time that, that person, that brother or sister in Christ, that person you can call up because they're, they're there for you, right? They, they've comforted you. But what is it that really brings all the comfort in the verse or through that person? It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful to know that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life? All right, last thing here. Look at verse 7. It says, and our hope of you is steadfast. And our hope of you is steadfast. Um, needless to say, many of the believers there in Corinth were a disappointment uh, to the Apostle Paul. Um, they were guilty of, of, of drunkenness. You see that in 1 Corinthians. They were guilty of drinking around the Lord's Supper table, actually. Uh, they were guilty of, of, of spreading gossip even about Paul, they spread gossip. There was immorality going on in that church at the time, a lot of immorality going on. There was actually incest. It was, it was awful, immorality going on. Um, they were misusing their spiritual gifts uh, there in that church. But what is Paul, and, and it very well could have been disappointed with them, right? But what does Paul say here? He says, and our hope of you is steadfast. You know, we ought to have hope in this. Hey, you look around and sometimes you think, well, man, that person, they're, they're, they're never going to get it right. Uh, they're never, I, you, you start losing hope in people. Uh, I heard about somebody this week that, that basically after the elections and then the other stuff, they just decided they had lost hope in humanity, period, you know. And that's, not the right, that's not the right attitude, right? But what do we know about believers? Philippians 1.6. Who has that verse? Do you want that verse, Brother Pete? You got that verse, right? That's your verse. We'll let you read it. Philippians 1.6. This very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful to know? We have this promise. And Paul, even look at this, this church, first the, 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 this Corinthians church that had caused so much disappointment, he says, our hope of you is steadfast. Our hope of you is steadfast. And may we have that same kind of attitude uh, towards others. Um, so we have a God um, that is the God of all comfort. God knows what's going on in our country and our nation. God knows what is going on in, in our church, in our families. God knows, and God cares, and God will comfort. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, uh, we love you. We are thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your grace and for your mercy. And Lord, we thank you, especially uh, studying this passage, Lord, we thank you for your comfort. Uh, Lord, there are many people that are troubled. Uh, Lord, I, I feel troubled um, at what's going on all around us, what's going on 
in our nation, in our country. Uh, but God, we know that you are in control. And Lord, we know that as the sufferings abound, that the, the comfort, the consolation abounded. And God, we pray that you'd help us, uh, that if we are going to suffer, Lord, that we would do it according to the sufferings of Christ. Uh, Lord, may we do it in your will, uh, for your glory, for your honor. Uh, Lord, not for selfishness, uh, Lord, not even for patriotism or for a man, but God, uh, for your kingdom. Uh, Lord, as a Christian, may we serve you. Uh, Lord, may that be our priority. And Lord, I pray you would help us uh, to not lose hope. Uh, Lord, may our hope be steadfast uh, in this time. Steadfast not in others, not in people, uh, not even in our political uh, politics or our government, but God, uh, may our hope be steadfast in you. And Lord, we know that you are God uh, that will take care of us and that will bring us comfort. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we study this series. God, we thank you for this uh, book. We thank you for the promises of it. May we live according to it. May you increase our faith uh, through this study. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.